Okay. Claire, I'm really excited to talk to you today for she can. I'm I'd love to know about your job and and tell us a little about yourself. Hi, it's really a pleasure to be here to talk to you today, Steffi. So, um uh, my name is Claire Mearns. I'm a consultant in anaesthetics and critical care at East Surrey Hospital, which is in Redhill. Um, yeah, I'm also an examiner for the Royal College of Anaesthetists, so examining trainee doctors um, as well. So busy and also a mum, which is <laughs> busy as well, as I'm sure you know. Yes. Um, Thank you, Claire. I'd love to understand your journey of how you got to where you are today. So I think I always wanted to be somebody who cared for other people. So even when I was like four years old, I was always picking up people in the playground and, you know, bandaging their knees. It was something that's really, really weird. That's something I always wanted to do. Um, I actually then watched too much you you won't do this because obviously you're you're not English or um but I watched too much Quincy on TV <laughs> I was about 12 do you know what that is so it's a program about a pathologist um solving crimes and um I wanted to be a forensic pathologist solving crimes um and cutting up bodies which sounds terrible um <laughs> So that's when I decided all right, I wanted to go to medical school. So very early on, I knew I wanted to be a doctor. Um, so I worked hard at school. I found school quite straightforward, I think. Um, and I, I went to Birmingham University Medical School um, in the UK, which I absolutely loved. Birmingham's a fantastic place. Um, so I did my basic medical degree there. Um, and then you have to do a year afterwards of sort of what's called house jobs, which I did in the local sort of region. I knew during my training that I wanted to be an anaesthetist so most people who are lay people won't know that because they well, anaesthetists other people who just boot to sleep and then just walk away actually we're the ones who deal with people who are unconscious so we take somebody who's walking and talking we render them unconscious stop them breathing um knacker their blood pressure so we're the ones who are always there in hospitals when people come in um as emergencies with pain, unconscious, in the, you know, having had big crashes. So I realised I loved it when people were really, really unwell and I needed to do something now. That's something that really floated my boat, which is a bit sick, I'm sorry, but that's just because I knew that it, you could do something, you could do something now and it just, I loved the drama and I loved that. So that's when I knew I wanted to do anaesthetics. So I got a job um, in my junior anaesthetic years in Wolverhampton, where I did two years training there got my exams which were really is really hard work so not only working at, th at that stage I think my worst week I think I worked 120 hours in one week so that was pretty bad so it was during the time when the hours were pretty hardcore um and yeah so that you know I, I loved I absolutely loved that job then and then I did another uh, year in a different hospital um, and then you have to sort of move up to your sort of registrar years. Um, and I knew I wanted to do, at that stage, I quite enjoyed the paediatrics of so sick children, which is even worse. Um, so I got a job in the uh, special care baby units. And this was in, I moved out to London, <clears throat> partly to do with the boy. Um, <laughs> that's my husband. but um, And that was a really hard job so I did six months in the special care baby in in Hackney so that's a really deprived area um I actually really hated the job the job I think I really missed doing anaesthetics so um but but there's a lot of intensive care for babies there um and then I kind of got registrar jobs in London at on the St Thomas's rotation so basically that's the whole of southeast England so it's a huge geographical area that trainees have to travel around um, and before that as well, I did six months in the paediatric intensive care unit doing the retrievals. So where we go out from our hospital to other hospitals to pick up sick children and bring them back to the unit. So that was a really busy, really good, but really intensely busy six months. I remember doing one job. I think we did like 12 hour shifts and going, I don't think I've had a wee today, you know, because you haven't had anything to drink. It's just um, really, really busy. I loved it. Um, and then I did another five years of my registrar job so that's in Canterbury and St Thomas's guys and 
um, sort of in the southeast, um, and then finally ended up where I am now. Which so that's sort of journey to get there. So it is. So when we talk about trainee doctors, they're they're qualified, but they they have different levels of skills that they need to attain to become a consultant. And I specialise at the moment in critical care, which is a big part of it. I'm also the lead consultant or clinical lead for critical care. Um, and I do some paediatric anaesthetics. I do some breast cancer work um, and I do hand surgery as well. So a really quite broad. And I absolutely love my job. Um, but the last two years has been hell. <laughs> I know I'm laughing. <laughs> yeah, it's been absolutely horrendous. So it was that's, that's, that's where from my training to where I am now. And it's ongoing. You know, it doesn't you don't stop learning um, in that process. So. It, it sounds incredible, Claire. I, 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 it's unbelievable. Thank you for all the work you do um, for everybody else. And uh, I can see the passion. Claire, I'm wondering, usually my next question would be something else, but I'm thinking because <laughs> you're a doctor, maybe we want to dive a little deeper as in how were the last two years for you? So I, so I work with a team of um, 10 consultants on critical care. And we're all really, really different people. So we're all quite strong minded. And I'm, I was sadly the leader at this time, which I couldn't cop to at a worse time. So I remember in about the November, December in 19, hearing about Wuhan on the news. And one of my colleagues who's incredibly clever, um, he's a sort of statistician and um, messaging on our group saying, this is really worrying. And I was just like, you know, your wives, you know, um, and then he kept on talking about it and I just wanted him to shut up <laughs> because I didn't really want to hear this. And then obviously it started to come to the ski areas um, and Italy was really badly hit. Um, and that's when it just was a bit closer to home than Wuhan. And again, he kept saying about it and I still was a bit, la la la, don't want to hear this. Um, and then when I think the first case came to the UK I can't remember what it was I have and he kept talking about it and I had a little bit of a meltdown about it because I was just thinking because he was talking about the potential numbers of people this might affect and it was such big numbers that I couldn't quite get my head around it and I just remember the day when I I understood what it meant and we actually had to get ourselves ready so normally just to put into context we at East Surrey have eight um, so we've got 10 ICU beds, so critical care beds, and six sort of high dependency beds, so like a, a space of 16. And we usually can manage eight people on a ventilator. So we were asked to think about our capacity that we have, which is eight, and to double that, and then to double it again. So we're talking 32 ventilated patients, which is, so currently in our intensive care unit, we have one nurse per patient. Um, so you're talking about not only about equipment, because we don't have that many ventilators, you're talking about well, where we're we gonna put those people because we don't have much space. We're talking about drugs, we're talking, about, and it suddenly, we rallied the troops and it was like, okay, we need to prepare, we need to practice so we don't know this disease, it's something we've never treated before. So there was a certain degree of real angst, I have to say, and, you know, some people got it and were on it, and some people were worrying about one thing and other people were worrying about something else. <clears throat> and the whole PPP situation, that was a really big issue because we never knew that if there was going to be enough. Obviously, this is we have to wear the full mask, which are horrendous to work in. I couldn't send you a picture of um, and the full gowns, which were really sweaty. The ones we've got at the moment are like shower curtains. So you're literally <clears throat> really sweaty in it. The patients can't you see your face, which is really horrendous. Um, so actually then we were waiting for our first patient because well the plan nationally was that we would get a patient and then they would go to the infectious diseases places up at um up in london i can't remember where so it's almost a relief and they they call it um anticipation anxiety where you're just feeling anxious waiting for something to happen and actually when the first patient arrived it actually was a real relief i know that sounds weird but because actually it's like you know this thing's coming and you're just like you know um and when it happens then it's almost a race we had our sort of first patient you know and they're fine and they have quite bad um pneumonia there i remember they were sort of quite young and then we had another one quite quickly who i remember um putting the breathing tube down for 
And then we have to, what we've had to do for most of these patients is, is nurse them prone, which means on their tummies. So turning over somebody who is 80 kilograms whilst they're unconscious, attached to all the, you know, t requires a team of um, eight people to do that. So that, so it came in slowly and everybody was sort of slightly, you know, not quite sure. And it sort of seemed okay to start with. And then I got COVID. <laughs> so ironically, I was at a meeting of the leads from the other intensive cares in, in the Southeast. So we've got a network of, of different intensive cares and we're coming back from that. And then the next day, one of the people from the trust who was in the car was said, oh, I've got cough and temperature. And then two days later, I got the same. And so that was me out. So I was off for, uh, it ended up being, being three weeks because I just felt so, it's the tiredness for me that was horrendous. Um, and when I came back to work, it was really funny because everybody was like, oh my God, you're back. Because I think they hadn't really seen anybody recover from it because it was really early on. So it was almost a relief to people that I'd survived. It was quite interesting. But what had happened whilst I was gone was just, it had exploded. I mean, we had filled our entire, so from like three patients that we'd had, the entire 16 beds of our intensive care unit, plus we'd taken over an entire other ward, which we'd had to fit up as an intensive care. Which, having said that, we had planned this before, so I did know this was, I did know this was coming. Um, and everybody was working, they knew what they were doing, they, we, they had, shut down other areas like theatre so they'd redeployed nurses to us these weren't intensive care nurses so they but they knew how to clean patients and whatever but they didn't know anything about ventilators so they were all like completely like this but people were just getting on with it they just um you know and the rate of arrival of patients was just insane so literally and they were all the same at this the, in the first wave they were all men in their mostly in their 40s and 50s slightly overweight with diabetes and hypertension mostly um and we were having to prone so turn them on their tummies and then you can only keep them there for so long and then you have to have a team who unprones and so it was just this um it, it's indescribable i can't really tell you and you're quite sort of cocooned because people who were obviously there was a national proper lockdown at that stage so people who didn't know anything about covid were going well what what's this about you know i do you know what I mean it didn't if it doesn't affect you you didn't know anybody who'd had it you were like well that surely they're making this up but I'm telling you it was completely insane um so there were uh, doctors in the hospital who weren't doing anything because obviously we weren't doing routine operating at that stage we're doing emergency still um you know so they were redeployed to us to to help do you know draw up drugs even because actually that sort of thing um so we had to have people on ventilators that weren't ideal. There were slightly crappy ones from, you know, that, that weren't intensive care ventilators. So at that stage, I think we went up to 35 ventilated patients, which is, that is that, I mean, that is insane in terms of the number. So it sort of, it expanded up and then it sort of came back, it came back down. Um, but it was yeah. just like, been sort of hit by a bit of a truck. It was like, whoa. And, and people died, you know, that was the other thing. It was... You know, we had a, a couple of people who actually worked in the hospital um, and there's no rhyme or reason. This, you know, this was actually a fit chap and it was heartbreaking because his, his wife had been in and, and it's when you're doing everything, literally everything, you're literally throwing pots and pans and... Yeah, I, 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 oh, I can't imagine it. Claire, I'm wondering what got you through it? What got you through it two years later? Um, what motivates you going out there? Keep on going out there to I do your job. It was really good. I mean, what, what we, um, to do our work, we sort of changed our, our sort of working patterns. So we worked, we, we changed into teams. So we did, you know, two days and two nights and then had a few days off and two days. And we were always with the same team. And actually, weirdly, it was almost like the good old days back when I was training when we were in teams. So actually we would um, see the patients and then we would eat food at like two in the morning, we'd get takeout. And it was actually amazing camaraderie. Um, I remember having a, it, it's funny, like thinking about the sort of stuff going on at number 10 at the moment with the lockdown stuff, but actually with our little team, it was my birthday over one of the um, lockdowns 
on one of the night shifts and so you know in the coffee room they'd got like a cake for me and stuff and it was so actually that was really amazing um weirdly the um clap the clapping thing on, on that Thursday night actually I always found really emotional and other, some of my colleagues actually were a bit like well what, what's by that but actually knowing people were supportive was actually really good my family said so my husband was amazing um I mean he's not a doctor but he just sort of you know just sort of support and and whatnot so we got you know we got through the first wave and then obviously it quietened down and then before the second wave hit I just you know half of us just thought I can't I can't do this again this is um and we, we thought well we'll do that we'll try you know we will okay essentially we'll do the same as what we did before and what we what we hadn't realized last time is that our hospital were hit incredibly hard whether that's because of Gatwick proximity um and obviously at that time there were a lot of flights coming in and out or whether it was because it's a big commuter belt so people up and down to London but the other hospitals in our region, so in, in Kent and Sussex, weren't. So actually the second time round, we were doing what's called mutual aid as we were transferring patients out. So when they were coming to our intensive care unit, we would then take the ones who were the mo most stable and transfer them to other intensive care units. Um, so, you know, there's a few places in Kent. Actually, no, Kent was bad because of the Kent variant, but so Sussex had quite a lot of our patients. And then we sent quite a lot this is when it started getting interesting because actually they then got sent far away. So our furthest one went to Newcastle. Um, so they went to Cheltenham, had quite a lot. The West Country had quite a lot because they didn't really get hit at all. So obviously that's then a whole different thing. You then have to tell relatives. I mean, having said that, relatives weren't visiting anyway. So it, in a way, it didn't make much difference unless that patient then died. And then that was a problem because they couldn't get there. Um, but putting somebody in the back of an ambulance and some of these went on airplanes is is wonky. It's you know, it's and the other thing is we were we were sending our most stable patients out or the best ones, which meant that we were left with the worst ones, which meant it felt like more of these patients died. And second time round, interestingly, the patients we had were really obese the second time round. Um, and again, we had more women as well, not necessarily obese, just um, so it was almost a very different disease second time around. It was really weird. Um, so again, we got through it. It was worse in terms of the amount of patients that we had, but because we were shipping out it, you know, we still were up to the sort of over 30 patients. So that then came back down again. So when they talked about the third wave, I just was like, I can't do this again. This, I really can't do this again. Um, and I think that when the vaccination came in, it did make a massive difference. So basically we're, we're own, we have only been seeing un, unvaccinated patients this time around, or those with some sort of hematological like lymphoma or leukemia who are, are vaccinated, but mostly it's been unvaccinated, which is deeply frustrating because, you know, so I had people who didn't believe in COVID and that's when you want to slap them, but obviously we don't. Um, all those who hadn't just hadn't got round to it, all those who thought, well, I'm fit, I don't need to. Um, so this time around, it was actually really well people who were quite young who got it. And that was just, yeah. So it's, and the angst, I remember when we, we obviously during the summer went down to no COVID patients. When we got our first one again, when it started, I mean, the angst of the nursing staff you could just feel was, was shocking, the sort of morale in the unit. We've had a lot of nurses leave. Um, really good people and it's not to go to other units it's actually to certainly to leave critical care and to go to other things or to leave nursing completely and that is you know horrendously sad I mean we have been supported with um, psychologists which has been really useful but essentially people are like this is this has been so difficult it's been really really hard um, and I, Claire, I how that. do you how do you feel now I mean, has it, is it sort of a burnout situation? Is it, uh, you know, how do you feel now? And how yeah, do I you feel I, motivated to keep going? I think certainly looking at my colleagues, there's a lot of difficulty in motivating, certainly after the, between the first and second wave, there was just like a real apathy, like, because we had just had normal things that we needed to do in terms of keeping the unit and updating policies and people were like, I'm done, you know, I'm done really. So I feel, 
I feel more positive now, I think, actually, because, you know, we'd done modelling for this wave and, and before Christmas and it looked horrendous. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't do this again. Um, but actually, it's not been like that this time. So I think the Omicron is not nearly as so There's been more people in hospital with it, but they haven't needed to come to critical care as many. Um, so it's almost like people are coming in with other stuff and they happen to have got COVID at the same time. It's, it's almost more like that. Um, so I, I feel, I'm, so I'm starting to feel more upbeat because I know that I hope that actually, and, and this is what you see with coronaviruses. The coronaviruses are viruses that are here all the time and they're generally what give us colds and stuff. Um, and that's why this, you know, they change all the time. Um, and as they say, the virus changes, it becomes more infectious, but less virulent. So it doesn't cause such an, a bad disease. And so that's what I'm praying. <laughs> so I'm really praying is true. And that is actually what we've seen, I suppose. So, um, yeah. Claire, thank you for talking about that. I know that <laughs> can't be easy. And, and, and I am really, really feeling with all of you and deeply grateful for, for these services. And I think, you know, for the first time, we as a collective have become so aware of how much yeah. we need the doctors and the nurses, how we have to appreciate them, how we have to improve their pay. And, you know, lots of things came to the forefront, which I hope yeah. that the politics will get around to dealing with at one point. Claire, I'm wondering, what do you think is your superpower? You obviously are all, I mean, all doctors have superpowers in a way, but what do you think makes you good at what you do and to persevere I, and have the resilience? I think for me personally, um, I think empathy is my probably superpower and super weakness at the same time. Um, I think if I remember it's the caring for, for me as a, as a doctor, if, if I don't care about what I do, then this is a completely pointless thing for me to be doing. And I remember I got to the point um, years ago, this isn't actually recently, where I felt a bit detached and not really caring. And I thought actually there's, so, and I'd, I'd, I would always say that to our, our trainee doctors, if you get to the point where you don't care, then what are you doing? There's no point doing this. So I think I'm really empathic with, my colleagues and the sort of patients um and I think there's a fine line between it with it not swallowing you up you know too much so um you keep that line that, that, yeah that yeah, invisible it's, line yeah it's difficult but you know and I think you know so during covid obviously because relatives weren't there they would send in this so these are patients who are ventilated and um, so relatives would send in notes or like emails to them um, uh, it's saying you know dear John uh, you know just letting you know and so we would read these out and this is, you know we did read them out and I remember reading some of these out so just holding the patient's hand you know they, they were sort of sedated but hearing is one thing that people retain but just being really sort of choked up about it because you can imagine oh good god yeah I can't imagine I mean I would yeah. not be able to do that for <laughs> Never in the world. <laughs> I'm choking up now. But Claire, what top tips would you give to other women? Or maybe what top tips can you give to other women doctors or girls who are aspiring to be doctors? It's funny, my um, daughter, when she was about six, I think I was late home one night and she was sort of sat in front of me and she said, I might like to be a doctor when I grow up. She said, um, the other thing is I'd never get to see my children which was like <laughs> knife to the heart. And she said, it, she didn't say it in a malicious way. It was really matter of fact. And I was a bit like, so I absolutely love my job, um, but it is really hard. You know, I think it's almost, I'd say like people who are thinking about having children, don't just do it. So if you're thinking about becoming a doctor, if you're thinking maybe I'd like to be a doctor, but, but I'm not sure it's like, don't do it. If you, but if you really, 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 really want to do it, this is the best thing ever to do which is absolutely the best job in the world um so I just say you know but there are I suppose there are sacrifices but you can do both things I am a mother as well but I guess any working mother it is that um about it um so I just say you know just make sure that your passion is in the right place and I remember when in my first year at medical school they were trying to put us off by saying why do you want to do this and actually I was going, but I do, I really do. And I'm glad I sort of stuck by it because it, it has been the best job in the world. Thank you, Claire. 
Claire, I'm wondering what your plans or dreams for your future, sort of <laughs> as a roundup question. I guess that's uh, work-wise and sort of home-wise probably. So work-wise, um, I say I'm the lead for the intensive care unit and I we need a bigger intensive care unit um, for our area. We do not have enough beds. So one of the dreams is to get a, all you know more funded beds and this is a huge battle that we're going through. I'm also hoping to, to um, go further in the Royal College of Anesthetists where I'm a currently an examiner. Um, so maybe to sort of take on the lead role uh, there for examinations maybe. Um, Home-wise, I think I just worry about my children all the time. <laughs> um, I want to see, I think I want my children to be people who work who and who are good company that I want to spend time with I think that's for any mother that is what we want for our children is it to be happy to work and to be somebody I want to spend time with Absolutely. Um, and I think for me I yeah I want to you know travel more and see the places that I've never had time to see um, I've also got a dog who I love as much as my children and yeah just sort of spend time um, it's really hard thinking further than sort of retirement like it's really hard um i can't really quite get there in my head but uh, those are the things that i'd like to do yeah but i love that thank you claire for it's talking to me it's been an amazing chat thank you so much no problem at all